Hello. Okay. So hi everybody and welcome. Uh, thank you for your interest and in joining with us here. So today I'm going to talk about one project which put uh, our infrastructure in Microsoft to a great test, and that is building extraction from satellite imagery. So here you can see one snapshot of our output, and we did its extraction for the whole United States. And so far, this was very fun and interesting project for us. So basically, today I will try to dive deep uh, into technical de details, how we did it, share some of our learnings, uh, showcase some problems that we faced, uh, some of the problems that remained, uh, and basically trying to improve your perspective and insights uh, what actually is needed uh, uh, for this to be done. So uh, this is some basic overview of our solution. So we have our component that extracts buildings, at the input are satellite imagery, uh, and the output, uh, at the output are produced uh, building vectors. Uh, inside the solution, actually, there are two stages. First stage is semantic segmentation, a deep neural net that, uh, uh, that classifies image pixels into whether they are buildings or not. And once we have these uh, building pixels, uh, we use in, poly in polygonization stage, we uh, convert them into the polygons. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is a two-stage uh, process. Ideally, what we engineers like is to make it uh, like one stage that can be end-to-end -end trainable, because whenever you have like cascade, uh, cascaded uh, design, uh, when you make improvements on the first stage, you actually hope that these improvements will propagate for the next stages. So, so far, uh, since uh, uh, we are still developing this method, we, every kind of improvement we did uh, actually uh, was showcased at the end point, but sometimes in the future when the, the project becomes more mature and gets saturated, actually some kind of solution that is end-to-end -end trainable uh, would be preferred. So what is actually needed of resources in order for this to be done? So you need excellent building labels, so your algorithm can learn what actually is the building on the image. Uh, you need a great and big infrastructure to run and process all of this data. And uh, regarding human resources, uh, in our case, it was three software developers working on this uh, for one year. Uh, we had some, previously we had some experience with machine learning, but fairly limited with deep learning. learning but uh, in this one year, we picked a lot of, of this. So regarding imagery, uh, in Microsoft we obtain imagery by referencing them through their CLAD keys. I think it's also very similar in other systems. Uh, there are these different level of details. Uh, you can like choose a go 18, 19, 20, depending on what kind of resolution you want. We selected 19 because for the human eyes, that is something uh, that uh, is desirable. It's our human hunch. Basically, what you would like to do, you would like to test with different levels, but this is very time consuming and uh, very too much resources are needed. With level 18, you might also recognize buildings mostly, but for example, for example other objects are cars, like cars lose their properties, they are too much pixelized, and even though we are not recognizing cars, we want our deep learning inherently to recognize this object because the final decision is based of all of these objects and how they interact because like recognizing a car is, is a strong feature that there is not a building below. But yeah, that's just one part in big, big equation. Regarding the scale, we have in US 4 billion like of these tiles. And one important thing is that uh, not all of the tiles, these tiles are shot by a single camera. We have like 14 different cameras with different camera properties. Ideally, you would like to train one single neural net with all of them. But uh, that, that is not optimal, or uh, it's uh, a, lot, a huge time for investigating how this can be properly done. Uh, so basically what we did, we clustered these uh, photographs into high focus photographs and low focus pot photographs and create a DNA network for each of these problems. So regarding our labels, uh, we use boulder buildings as our labels. Boulder buildings are buildings uh, that we came into possession by acquiring a boulder company, which did the mapping. They are of excellent quality. Uh, edges follow uh, building edges on images well. They are well, uh, they're also very granular. 
in this large building cluster, each building is uh, uh, separately identifiable. Uh, they are very good aligned with Bing imagery. And one of the most important properties for deep learning is they are clustered uh, into fully labeled, uh, uh, fully labeled clusters. So basically, as they selected like 100 uh, clusters of interest and started labeling systematically in these kind of areas. So this is kind of data we want in deep learning. We don't want uh, sparse data because uh, the images we feed into the deep neural nets, all buildings on these images uh, must, be uh, must be present. Uh, so uh, we were lucky with that. So creating the training set was not uh, too hard. For training the set, you need the, bear, the pair of image and the pixel masks, uh, which show to the deep neural net how to learn to recognize the buildings. So once we have these uh, clusters, we just uh, take crops of the images for there and take these uh, labels from our spatial database, render the image where the building mask is. Even we added some of these uncertainty areas, few pixels around the edges because this rendering, because of pixelization rounding, uh, you know, it can offset by few pixels, uh, but, and, we, and because of some alignment problems, and then we don't want that, that have a huge cost in our training. Also, first time when we train with these images, uh, we have very good results in residential areas, but in some rural areas, uh, wilderness, mountains, glaciers, deserts, and so on, uh, some of the images we didn't have in the training set, we, perfor we performed bad. So actually what we did uh, in, from, Bing, uh, uh, from Bing knowledge, we extracted areas, uh, different various areas, uh, and sampled from those and added to the training set. So what we end up with is a training site set which has like 5 million high focus imagery and around 1 million low focus imagery. So in storage sense, it is like 150 gigabytes of data. Uh, so it's a very big uh, training set. And for, to be able to train on this big train, training set, uh, you, need a high, uh, uh, you need a very good tooling. In Microsoft, we prefer CNDK as our deep learning platform because it uh, makes possible to train on multiple GPUs. Uh, for this case, we use 64 GPUs, and 64 GPUs ha have huge uh, bandwidth. And uh, when you have this huge bandwidth, one important thing is to think is, can you read the, fast, the data as fast as these uh, uh, GPUs can process it? But uh, CNTIC infrastructure and in Microsoft, we uh, thought already about this. Uh, we store our data on HDFS. It can be parallel streamed into the, these GPUs. So we have a pretty good infrastructure for dealing with this. Regarding the ar architecture, we use uh, ResNet models with uh, 34 layers. And for upsampling, up uh, we use uh, RefineNet. So if you're interested in more details about this, you can contact me uh, later. So this is how our predictions uh, look like. Uh, we pretty much perform very good. They are like uh, some of uh, misclassifications. For example, in the first case, you see like the problems with the shadows, but actually DNN was not confused with it. In the second example, again here, uh, the shadowing actually caused some misclassification. Also here, you can see uh, this is like some uh, ground corridor. Uh, miss, uh, also, our network was confused, and you can see like a little holes, and you can see how it was uncertain whether, like this area here, is a building or not, because you know these buildings are a little problematic uh, because their roofs are similar to the neighboring roads. And uh, since we are still working in a pixel domain, you can see our precision and recall in uh, pixels. So uh, the next stage is polygonization. Uh, you would think that the hardest part is like completed and uh, that polygonization is something that can be easily done. Uh, that's what we thought as well. So when you want to solve this problem first, uh, when you look uh, to some existing solutions, you come up with a Douglas Peck algorithm, uh, which polygonizes uh, the predictions. The problem is that this algorithm in its nature is very greedy. So it makes some decisions based on some, uh, uh, on some local space, so basically it goes pixel by pixels, and then some pixel is offset uh, on a line for a, some, some value, it makes a decision that that's a new edge. Uh, and you get some images like this, you know, which really, really look, polygons which like, look really funny, you know. 
they actually don't look like buildings. You know, human can say, you know, these, these are not buildings. You know, they don't look like buildings. So actually, what we want is a polygonization algorithm, uh, which can uh, look at the prediction as a whole and make uh, these polygonization decisions uh, uh, at once. So we look for this solution. We were not able to find it, so we invented our. So uh, what we do, here is some brief example of how we do it. So we extract the outline uh, and any kind of mathematical operation on two d in 2D space is very complex. So we transform it to the 1D space, do some uh, fitting, and produce the final polygon. So actually, here what we do, uh, we create a turning function of the input, input curve. So basically, uh, this function contains uh, the angle between each consecutive uh, point. So if you have a line, in a line, each consecutive point form a uh, same angle. So lines would be identified like horizontal lines here. And since polygon is a set of lines, what you actually want to do, once you have this 1D representation, is to fit a stepwise function in order to obtain the polygon lines. So this produced a little bit better results than Douglas Packer, but still not as good. Because again, uh, these uh, predictions don't actually look uh, like uh, buildings. And now the question is, you know, what exactly is building? You know, what is some of our a priori knowledge how building actually looks? And when you think about it, uh, usually buildings, you know, each consecutive edge form right uh, 90 degrees angle. Usually the edges are of length more than three or five meters. You cannot have a consecutive edges which form like less than 15 degrees. These are like numbers I'm just throwing out of my head. But still that, so we impose some rules in this polygonization uh, in order to, uh, when we fit this function, we want to avoid this kind of situation. So when we fit this line, if it's like the next fit forms like 80 degree angle, we ask, okay, can we just slide it over to be 90 degree? And the way, if the cost, error cost is like, remains similar, we just keep it as there. So actually, there are a lot of manually controlled parameters, uh, which makes this process a little bit hard. So we basically choose what are these uh, constraints, and then, then we do some random search in on cross-validation set to find the optimal thresholds and so on. But actually what we would like, uh, and we will definitely explore, explore next, is how to do this uh, in automatic way. Since we already have a huge set of existing buildings, maybe we can uh, create a neural net, which, is, uh, which will inher uh, in itself and code some building properties, and which can provide feedback to the polygonization algorithm to produce uh, the polygons that actually look like buildings that exist currently in the world. So regarding the metrics, so more completeness is like the most used metrics today. It's like intersection over union. But actually, this is not good enough uh, uh, metric to use for evaluation. Uh, this metric will tell you typically that uh, your prediction is of, or is of good size, uh, is on right location. But uh, when you see uh, the prediction that you have high met value of this metric, you, you just see your human eye can see, you know, this is not that building uh, uh, that looks like the label. So this first metric uh, tells you some things. So that's why we introduce additional metric, uh, which tells you, uh, so which tells you what, what is the shape of the building. So if the label is uh, square and your prediction is triangle, uh, it would produce a bad score. So basically, this other metric uh, shows how the shapes are similar. But even in this case, you have similar shapes. You have very strong intersection over union, but your rotation is quite not right. And for human eye, even one degree of rotation is you simply notice it. Uh, I don't like when I see my predictions form rotation angle more than one degree. So this is also a third metric, uh, which you must also consider. And, and this now becomes a very big problem for, for the next steps of how to improve the, uh, the whole process. Because now we can ask, you know, should we improve our DNN? Should we improve our polygonization? Or maybe create everything to be end-to-end -end trainable? But what is the purpose if we're still not sure, you know, what is the metrics how to measure 
uh, what is better and what is not. So here are some evaluation results uh, of our extraction on our evaluation, on our evaluation set, which is 15,000 buildings. So our matching matrix is, our precision is above 99%, so less than 1% of the buildings, uh, we, we have predictions where there is actually no building. Uh, but let's look at the quality metrics. So you have these three metrics, completeness, shape distance, rotation distance, and one interesting thing here is that our extracted buildings have generally better metrics than OSM. So yeah, met metrics doesn't lie, but what you need to always to remember yourself and looking into the metrics, that metrics are not perfect, they don't lie, but they tell you something completely different. You can remember that actually our labels are bolder buildings, labeled by humans. And OSM is also labels labeled by humans. So our labels are not like are created by God. So if you see like some what would be like perfect label in some space, it can be somewhere here. Boulder buildings error can go in this direction in this space. OSM buildings can go in other direction. So it becomes very. We need to rethink uh, actually how the metrics uh, should be done. Uh, uh, what we can say from these results that we are pretty close uh, at the quality of our buildings is pretty close to both uh, OSM and both uh, and Boulder buildings. Uh, here you can see charts, histograms, that the majority of our buildings on completeness are better, on turning distance are better. But these charts of rotation angle gives, gives us some interesting insight. Because you can see up to top 90% on this metric, our extractic buildings are better than OSM. But suddenly on last 5%, this average becomes to rise very quickly which means that uh, our buildings on average are very good, but we still have problems on some outliers, on some small subset of buildings where we are pretty bad. And usually these pretty bad buildings are large buildings, skyscrapers, because we have them like very small amount in our uh, data set. And the other thing, in order to deep neural net, to see the whole view of this large building, it need to be much deeper. And this is some compromises that need to be made, but in our case, this is not interesting because actually OSM already have these buildings. The whole point of what we do is actually to fill the gaps. So, so 100 terabytes of data. It took like two weeks on 44, 64 GPUs to extract all the buildings. Uh, since our model is fully convolutional, we run on uh, larger buildings. When running on larger buildings, you connect higher resolution, better resolution images. Uh, there are artificial lines formed. Our training model uh, didn't learn how to differentiate this. So in these lines, it produces like some problematic predictions. So in our output, we filter areas where these high uh, and low resolution images are connected. Uh, we published uh, buildings on uh, Bing. So what we did, we took OSM buildings uh, and added all CV buildings uh, that are not intersecting uh, with the OSM. Also, our buildings you can find on our GitHub repo. What we additionally think, if you were here like uh, two hours ago, uh, in Australia, we had problems with uh, paved uh, property of the roads. So basically, once we have all of this solution from blank paper to some design and processing for the whole Australia, it took us basically uh, uh, two weeks. And one more thing, uh, we are getting more and more different kind of images, street side images, oblique images, we can do, where we can do extra various uh, things. We can even think about how to combine all of these images and process them in parallel. So, grazie ragazzi. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Nicola. Do you have any question from the public? Hi. Hi. How did your algorithm perform on round buildings like oil tanks? Thank you. Great question. So as you can see, our polygonization algorithm fit lines. So actually, uh, we don't do well on curved buildings. So that's also another out outlier in our metrics. Yeah. 
Okay, hi. Uh, hi. I would imagine that in areas in which buildings are really close to one another, your predictions might actually overlap. Yes. So how do you split them after? Do you, have you experimented with like maybe instant segmentation or do you just do some like morphological transformations like opening, closing in order to separate different buildings where your prediction is just like one blob, you know? Yes. So, uh, so far we produced just a single building, but, that, but we thought about these ideas. So one idea that we tested, since we have a parcels data for USA, USA, to use parcels to split these buildings. But yeah, that approach, when we do this and do additional instance segmentation, which we can use to split the buildings, that's like the next step uh, to do. Hi. Hi. So in your previous slide, I saw uh, uh, like a uh, 45 angle image. I think if I'm correct, the, the, the one below. So do you think uh, like a, a future step would be to also capture or detect the height of the building and maybe, I don't know, like the, the 3D shape at some point? Yes, so basically with this oblique imagery, like our some initial tests show that each of these locations is shot with like almost 40 cameras uh -huh. from different azimuth and elevation angles. So creating some 3D perspective sounds very interesting and possible. So, yeah, cool. maybe. We are contemplating on all these things. Hello, I'm interested in how do you handle the parallax error? So if you have your aerial imagery, it's not uh, always taken center down. So the footprint on the ground is not the outline of the roof of the building. So how do you shift the, the footprint later to the correct position on the ground? So uh, we don't do any kind of post-processing and pre-processing. So basically, if we have shots from the angle, it might be that our footprint uh, is not uh, quite well uh, corrected. Uh, but uh, what we also showed is somehow, uh, you know, these deep neural nets are fascinating. Based on the shadow, you know, sometimes it produces prediction like that is offsetted, not like the roof like, follows the footprint. Just because the label was like that, you know, when it has label, which is exactly on the footprint, and there is some shadow nearby, these DNNs are amazing. In some cases, even they figure it out on their own. So, but yeah, we didn't do any kind of additional processing for that. Hi, Hi. Uh, have you experienced the tiling issues? I, I didn't hear you. Uh, have you experienced the tiling issues when you perform detection? So yeah, there are, there are tiling issues. So that's why when you run your model, so we're training on these like small tiles, but when we run it, we run it on these huge tiles. But then again, you can, there is some limitation by GPU memory, what is the maximum image size. So what we actually do, we uh, take uh, predictions, but there is always like this kind of small overlap between it and it, this is not like, uh, yeah, that was the problem, but yeah, we solved that. Other questions? I, I have one. Uh, about the validation, so you use as ground truth just OpenStreetMap data for the three messages you provided with rotation mm -hmm. and differences, and you show some outliers there, the 90%. Yes. Percent. Uh, you, you verify that, that it's all made by, it's all due to the, uh, this big uh, skyscraper or something like that? Some big and complicated buildings because in our polygonization stage, as I said, we had some constraints. So visually, we make our uh, ed edges on our buildings to be like 90 degrees, but there are some funny looking buildings that actually don't look like buildings yeah. and our polygonization fits them uh, as we designed it. So yeah. You didn't use other like external footprints or for buildings to check if those are not OSM means growing. So actually our labels are these boulder buildings. Okay. So these are of very high quality. When we do side by side comparison between boulder and OSM, boulder was better in most of the cases. Okay. Hi. Uh, Hi. How big was the misalignment in the training data, data between the satellite imagery and the building mass? So uh, we had luck uh, with this uh, data set. It seems like uh, they used our Bing map to uh, label the buildings. So we didn't have any problems with misalignment. But misalignment will become problem when we, 
then we obtain a new set of images, new fresh images that might be al not anymore aligned with boulder buildings. So yeah, we are now making some solution which uses this like, uh, in photography when you make like this 360 degree, that's how to align to similar. So these images are similar, like one year difference between they are taken. And so our label can remain aligned. Thank you. We have no time for other questions, so we need to pass to new presenters. Thank you.